I'm going to be doing some bioethics of some of my historical work, which is around cosmetic surgery and performance enhancing drugs, all mildly interesting. And uh, we were sitting there at one of these, you know, those dreadful icebreaker things that you have to do. Oh, tell us something you do that we don't know about. And I said, well, I used to work in a social media consultancy. And Ruth Faden, who's the director of the Bioethics Institute at Johns Hopkins University, smelt blood because she'd heard of this social media thing. And went, ooh, are there bioethics issues in social media? And I thought, don't think so. The more and more I thought about it, the more it came to become apparent that there are a huge amount of ethical issues create, uh, that emerge from research involving social media. Um, and I started working on this in, in 2008. And um, one of the previous speakers mentioned that uh, very f we, there's not been much progress uh, in the last six or eight years in terms of putting science communication out online. And to be brutally honest, there's not been a great deal of progress in the discussion of ethical issues uh, in terms of social media in the last uh, six to eight years. In fact, there's been barely any at all. When I first tried to start publishing this work in 2008, 2009, journals had literally no idea what I was talking about. The notion that there was some sort of ethical challenge around this Facebook thing that the kids are using with the interwebs and the hoo-hahs and what what, not a nothing at all. It may have been, it was just crap research, I don't know. Um, but I prefer to think that I was the head of my time. So it's lovely to be here now, at my time, with people who understand what on earth I'm talking about, hopefully. So I'm going to talk to you about the ethics issues, because they keep coming up, right? Here's this Facebook scandal, the slightest small Facebook scandal of a, you, you all saw this, right? Facebook were manipulating their feeds, showing us some sad things, some happy things. And it turns out, not a great psychological research, that if you show people sad things, they feel sad. This is, uh, well done, Facebook. Um, <laughs> clear for people, clear for people. But other, um, other online, uh, other social media companies are doing uh, similar things. Okay, Cupid were fixing people up with weird people, they shouldn't have been fixing them up, but that's very bad. Um, so there's this idea that there was a lot of sort of outrage uh, about this amongst users, that this is somehow there, that the researchers are doing something unethical. Is this, are they betraying our privacy? No, are they interfering with our data? Possibly, is that it? So there was a generalized sense of outrage, but no one could quite pin down what it was. So what I'm going to try and talk to you today uh, about is trying to pin down some of those issues around the ethics of using social media in research. Um, so this is the outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about types of social media research, and very much like sort of Coles to Newcastle thing. Um, and then some examples of that. I'm going to use mostly examples from healthcare research, because that's my field. I'm a bioethicist by trade. And then look at some of the ethical challenges, how they represent old ethical challenges that we've had very much for, for decades in healthcare research, but how they are sort of manifest in new and exciting ways. Uh, and then that sort of awful thing, take her messages um, for overcoming uh, some of those uh, ethical challenges. Uh, and then you can ask me questions, or you can just walk out and send to you. So, uh, types of social media research. There are, in terms of uh, health research, in particular, there are probably two, you can probably divide things into two, roughly. Research using social platforms, and research into social content. And for the purposes of today's talk, um, I'm going to talk about the bottom set about research into social content. I was at the World Health Organization last week giving a talk on research using social platforms, patient-led research where people are sharing their genomic and uh, healthcare data um, and creating their own kinds of, um, uh, precisely this sort of thing, creating their own experiments, leading, designing their own trials and protocols. Uh, has anyone heard of patients like me? That's a, ooh, 2%, uh, well done. Um, anyone heard of ginger.io? One person, brilliant. Um, so these are emerging platforms where patients with particular disease conditions and particular health conditions can basically share all the information they like, and then the, uh, the platforms themselves sell that data to researchers, to pharmaceutical companies. Very exciting. And the, it's very, very clear when you sign up that this is what's going to happen. And people are signing up to patients like me in particular in their thousands. These are people from, with neglected disease conditions who feel like their disease is not getting... Uh, enough research done, research is very slow, so they feel like, let me push all my data out there, I can help. Huge amounts of privacy and other ethical issues, but I'm not going to be talking about that. So, this is what I'm going to talk about today, because I feel like this might fit a little more uh, nicely in with uh, the, the sort of altmetrics ethos, which is research into social content. Um, here are two sort of classic, or almost uh, semi generic. Um, can you be semi generic? I don't know. Um, research into social concepts. So two, two sort of uh, very basic um, 
uh, social pieces of social content that health researchers have used in that. Facebook, a cancer survivor's website. These are fascinating uh, Facebook pages for sociologists and for oncologists and for social workers into uh, exploring the ways in which people deal with the news, the diagnosis of cancer. It's about resilience uh, for families and friends. And the same also for the, the Cancer Survivor Network there on Twitter. All these extraordinary and exciting pieces, all these data points that are coming up from people freely sharing opinions, facts, data online using uh, social media. And this is the content that really excites a load of health uh, healthcare researchers. Um, there's, a, there's a very terrifying book called Acres of Skin, which is, okay, I'm gonna ask a question. This is a weird question. Uh, who is wearing deodorant? That's actually, who's not? No. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a research ethics history question because most of your, um, uh, most of your dermatological products um, the only reason they don't really hurt, like burn your skin off and you die, is that they were tested on prisoners in a maximum security prison in Pennsylvania in the 1960s, um, where prisoners were in this extraordinarily bad kind of uh, high security prison, and they were paid basically to, to test um, uh, dermatological products, um, and all sorts of problems with doing that. So the book is called Acres of Skin because the doctor who ran those ethically dodgy experiments said as soon as he went into the prison, he said, I was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. And there's a tendency among some of my healthcare researcher friends to look at things like Facebook and Twitter with all these people sharing exciting and interesting data and opinions and go, ooh, acres of data, fantastic. Um, but people are not fields, and this is an important thing uh, to bear in mind. The framework that um, ethicists have tended to use when, when thinking about this is the idea of surveillance, monitoring, and listening. But this sort of research into social content is largely about surveillance. 100 history points for anyone who knows what that's a diagram of. Oh, you work at the Wellcome Trust, that's true. Anyone does? <laughs> Both, no. So 100 imaginary points for Adam, well done. It's the panopticon, Bentham's idea of a prison in which you can see all from the center and everything is being constantly monitored. Your every move is monitored. And this is the sort of, uh, this is the ideal researcher's dream, right? That you can see all of this data. You can see all of these opinions and interesting facts. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is to take you through three examples, um, some of which are from uh, very much in the early stages of, uh, of social media stuff, and some of which are, are, are much more recent, which highlight some of the ethical challenges that are involved when you use social data, when you're doing research into social content in the surveillance monitoring slash listening modes. So the first one I'm going to tell you about is one of my, uh, one of my favorite stories. This is, this is fantastic. This is the case of the tweeting kidney patient, um, a lost Sherlock Holmes story. Um, this is uh, Jane Manley, who is a, a kidney patient, who, um, as many kidney patients, has, has not got great mobility, isn't always able to get out because, as you know, dialysis and other sorts of things restricts mobility. So she, like many people in, in, in that disease community, used Twitter, used Twitter to uh, get in contact with other people to chat, to have a community around, and they were sharing stories, exchanging experiences, chatting, and in many ways giving each other advice. Um, what Jane didn't know is that her specialist was reading her Twitter feed, um, but not following her on Twitter. He wasn't on Twitter. She had not closed down her Twitter to only followers. So she goes then one day to a consultancy with, with, with her consultant, and he says, actually, Jane, the following things that you said on the Twitter feed are completely wrong. And in some ways, it's not exactly dangerous, but you really don't want to be doing that. That's not good food to be eating with your particular condition. Um, so she's being monitored by a doctor. And we see things like this, so some American insurance companies have started to say, well, maybe actually you ought to be monitoring people's Facebook and Instagram pages, because all people do is post pictures of giant burgers. And if you're a beast and we've got to pay for your stuff, maybe actually we say, no, this is your own damn fault. So it exposes this thing. <laughs> so Jane is in good spirit. Lol, don't have a lot of that. Mr. Casares has pointed out gaps. How embarrassing is that? Well, it's very embarrassing. But what if Jane had been a HIV patient? What if Jane had had some other form of stigmatizing condition? What if her doctor had found out things about her behavior that she simply didn't want her doctor to know? Um, it quite <laughs> begs questions about privacy. And what it does beg, and, and as we'll see as we go on, what kind of space is Twitter? Is it a private space? Does Jane have an expectation of privacy from her doctor? within that relationship, or is it a public space in which whatever you put out there, everyone has the right to monitor, survey, or listen into. 
this goes on, talking about stigmatizing conditions. I'm currently advising a National Institutes of Health, um, K Award, which is an early career development award, on using Twitter to uh, monitor mental health chatter. Um, in a similar way to, uh, to, to people who are made less mobile by physical conditions, um, people with depression in particular, depression and or anxiety, find uh, sort of physical social contact or going out into, into what we might call the normal regular world to, to be problematic. But online spaces, social spaces, Twitter, for example, give them a great opportunity to talk to one another on their own terms in some ways, in safe spaces. And this is a very exciting thing for mental health professionals, because here you've got a group of people who've got good amounts of influence over each other, and it's only, oh, that classic science thing, only we can get them to change their behavior by just pinpointing the influential one, and then the rest of them would take their meds, and everyone would be compliant, and boom, healthcare costs would go down. It seems like a very exciting research proposition. And so the, 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 the scholar I'm working with at, at NIH um, is exploring the possibilities of this. Can we monitor Twitter? for example, the social content of Twitter, to find out different things about particular mental health states and particular communities and mental health service users so that they can identify their service needs. This all sounds utterly benign, right? Utterly benign. It's a good idea, right? We want to give good mental health services to people. Health service users who are using Twitter don't want you to listen in to their conversation because this is their safe space. Right? This is where this is for them. This is for them to talk to one another. This is for them to exchange stories, support mechanisms, for them to encourage resilience. And they also feel that this is not what that is for. They are not here to get help from outside people. This is an internal thing to them. This is for their community of identity. And the, the guy I'm working with also talked about um, these aren't the actual particular people, sorry, I should say these, uh, these Twitter uh, handles. And this is just uh, an example. Um, one of the propositions that we contemplated was, should we be trying to identify the influencers within these networks? Should we be saying, actually, you are really influential within that mental health user, service user network, so you'd be a great person to come and talk to these psychiatrists and people. Da, da, da. People don't want to be identified as influential in some networks. People don't want to be identified at all as a member of a particular network, or they don't want to have the pressure put on them to be part of an intervention. This is the idea that the community, this online community, which is generating all this really rich, and some of it's amazing, this social content around mental health, that's not what that community is for. It's not there to create an intervention. It's not there to have research done on it. And to do research on it is a violation, they believe, of what their community is for. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, it's public. It's Twitter. Right? You could close it down, but they don't want to close it down completely because the idea is that it's open to other mental health services. So we're faced again with this um, disjunction between it's a public space, but there is a clear need slash expectation of privacy here. And so that's a real ethical rub for us. I'm going to take you all the way to um, 2009. Now, is anyone born in 2009? Okay. Um, and Okay, here's another. Uh, I've asked you about Deirdre. Who's familiar with flash fiction? Slash fiction, I'm sorry. Come on, be honest. So slash fiction, for those of you who won't mention what it is, is a very intriguing um, uh, subgenre of internet fiction where um, they, it's fan fiction but uh, sexy times. So it's basically uh, uh, Kirk and Spock uh, kill the Klingons and then... Um, <laughs> And all sorts of other things. And it's very much connected to queer politics, uh, to radical feminism, um, to, uh, to crypt theory and disability and things like that. So it very much challenges level uh, class uh, and, and racial and ethnic norms around that. And it's very exciting, and, and some of it's really disturbing. Uh, but there is a big community of people out there who, who feel this is their stuff. And so uh, in 2009, some scholars from, I can't remember now, which uh, some very eminent Northwestern American University, um, decided that they wanted to monitor all these conversations and, and the writing around, um, around some uh, slash fiction websites to draw some conclusions about uh, queer identities online, about feminism online, and things like that, because they're like, well, this is great. This is all out there. This is this new, exciting public data that we can read. And so they tried to send out um, uh, a survey which is what you do when you're a social scientist, have a survey. Um, weapon of choice. And 
they send this survey out thinking, well, of course they were thrown in. And, and, and this is the response from a, a particular uh, slash fiction. This is 2009. Um, and so we decline to be interviewed by you. We decline to be the object of your fascination. We decline to be naturalized. We decline to allow our political project to be cited in support of the very discourses we are trying to question. And this is basically a fore-echo of what the mental health service is saying. This community that we have created is not here for your research enjoyment. We are not here to be poked and prodded by you. We have our concerns and values that we're trying to put forward. And this really is our private world. It's public, but it's our private world. So how do we manage this thing? What's this? Is this a mess up? A bang? Uh, anyway, how do you manage this problem, this clash between public and private expectations when we're talking about research into social content, whilst bearing in mind that these communities have their own political, economic, and their own health concerns that may be in direct opposition to health research? Big issues, privacy. So regulation, academic a bit. Um, the guide to read about privacy to try and conceptualize privacy, good, really good Christmas dinner party game, is to ask someone to define privacy. Very, very hard. No one can actually do it. Daniel Solos had a jolly good go at it in a law review article in the whole book. Um, and uh, the book that I recommend is Understanding Privacy. And in it, he uh, elucidates um, a, a taxonomy of privacy. In particular, the taxonomy of how your privacy can be violated. And that's where the ethical rub comes. When privacy is violated, there's some ethical problem. So information is collected, processed, disseminated. Those first three types of privacy violation can all be done with your consent. That's absolutely fine. This is Solo's idea. That everything, you can have information collected about you with your consent, you can have it processed about you with your consent, and you can have it disseminated about you with your consent. And if you go back to the Facebook scandal, all of that was seemingly done with our consent because we'd all tick the little box saying uh, that we agreed to the terms and conditions. What Solov says, however, is that the real problem comes when your privacy is invaded, when any of the three things above are done without your consent, when your privacy is invaded, when information is collected on about you without your consent, when it's processed, put together, analyzed, algorithmed, without your consent, and when it's disseminated, when it's turned into a journal paper um, that no one will read, but you will put into a PDF and carry around because it was yours, yes. None of these things, if they're done without your, five minutes, that's fine. Um, they're done without your consent, it's an invasion of your privacy. But that doesn't get us anywhere with the Twitter issue, right? Because Twitter is, you're putting it out there in public, so it's not private, so how do you do it? So we add something else, we add a new part to the taxa. And this, again, is from uh, 2008. So a lot of these ideas were generated in, in, in the, in the, towards the end of the last decade. We really haven't moved on very far since then. This is um, Patricia Sanchez, Abril, and Anita Carver. Health privacy in a techno-social world, a cyber patient's bill of rights. You can tell all these cyber patients. <laughs> Doctor Who and the cyber patients. Um, and they add a new thing, self-exposure. Are the people on Twitter indulging in self-exposure? Are mental health service users? exposing themselves online. How does that work? Is that a violation of privacy? And a lot of this comes down to this issue of expectations of privacy. Even though you have exposed certain parts, certain pieces of information about yourself, you may yet, within a certain ethical schema, have an expectation of privacy. And these are two questions that we might want to ask ourselves as we sort of come towards the end of this. Do social media users have a responsibility to protect their own privacy? Do we go one way and say this is all about the user? Do we put the onus all on the user? It's your responsibility to protect yourself from being monitored, from being surveilled, from being part of any sort of data mining, any social content kind of research. Or do we flip it the other way around and say what responsibilities are placed upon researchers to respect social media users' privacy? Do social media users, are they worthy of the respect. If we, we think they're discussing something that they don't want to be used, should we draw a line across it and say, actually, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to use that for research? Or, as someone put it to me last week at the, at the WHO, um, do we have a right, do we have a responsibility to respect their publicity, to respect the public nature of it? When we do a lot of social content research and we publish it, we tend to anonymize people for the sake of protecting their privacy, sort of this half-assed, half-way-has. 
Um, that sounds like an enchanting hotel, doesn't it? The half fast halfway house. Um, but actually, some people who are telling their stories out there online, they want to own that story, are infuriated and angered when you anonymize their story that is about them, right? That you say, here is an extraordinary thing about someone who um, uh, was perhaps a, a survivor of cancer, particularly of recalling form of cancer, anonymous. It's like, not anonymous, me, my story, my life. How dare you say that? I'm not part of it. So you can flip both of these things. Whose responsibility? Where does the responsibility lie? And another um, responsibility question we have to ask is when you're doing social content data, I just like to show this slide because it's mildly amusing. What responsibility do you have when you're searching and listening to social content to correct people, especially in the health world, when they're saying something really scary and wrong? We've all seen this one, I assume. Um, and this happens to health researchers a lot. I know lots of people who work um, on uh, NSN, men, who's, uh, men Who Have Sex With Men uh, forums, and there's a lot of very dangerous uh, discussions on some of those forums about safe sex. It's not actually really safe at all. Do you have a responsibility to step in and say, actually, no, that's actually a, a, a potentially uh, deadly, uh, a potentially very, very dangerous way to, to easily get infected with HIV if you carry on with that kind of sexual practice. But you as a researcher going into a, a, a forum that's really just about gay men talking to one another, that can be highly damaging to the, the integrity of the community. It can be very damaging to that community's relationship and opinion of researchers. Again, is it a private thing that you respect or is it a public thing that you have access to? So to finish, um, before Adam throws something at me, um, some approaches and solutions that we might want to think about. And these are things that um, we were throwing out there until 2008, 2009, and I think we can, we can, we can come back to it anyway. The first is transparency. When we're doing uh, social research, when we're doing research into social content, to be absolutely open and honest about what we're doing. The only way that we've been able to get anywhere with the, uh, the work that we're, we're, we've been talking about uh, with mental health services is to be very open about the fact that it's going on and to approach those communities head on and to be clear and honest about what we want to do. That has some problems for some psychological research and some behavioral research, because then you sort of quote the pitch, as it were. But it's a, it's a good place to start thinking. Community involvement, be social, explanation. If you're going to do research into online communities, you should probably involve those communities at the beginning stage of doing the research. We would never dream now of dropping into West Africa doing some research on Ebola without involving the community and community leaders and respecting their values at the beginning of it. And I don't really see why we shouldn't do the same when we're talking about social content and social communities online. And finally, I think this one just sort of goes for everything online. Uh, Will Wheaton for. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we still have Dan. Were there any questions for him? We've got a couple of minutes. Be surprised if the end. Got a question in the front row? I think publishing something to, I think some, oh sorry, the, the question is does a researcher who publishes a paper um, become a public figure in the way of a celebrity or a politician or a film star and do they? Well, it just sort of Let's say your publication record, is that something that everybody can reuse or you need permission to ask the researcher that kind of stuff? I would think you don't need permission of the research because the, in the way that the, the values of the community of mental health services on Twitter is that that community is for them. Publisher, people, academics put their work out online to be read by as many people as possible. So it's an expectation of publicity rather than an expectation of privacy. Um, I just love the idea of having a publication record good, in, good enough to get the paparazzi following me. That would be great. <laughs> uh, but I think it's about what it was. It's about intent, and a lot of ethics can have that that, that idea that this was intended for this purpose and it's used for that purpose. That's absolutely fine. I do know that we, we know that, that some researchers do get in, uh, do have problems with becoming very well known to particular communities um, who uh, are very pressured to them because they're not following particular research agendas. But again, that research is out in the public domain and it's been deliberately put out in the public domain. Right at the back. Do the terms and conditions provide a trump card? So, for example, I understand that you go to TV studio where the or give permission to 
was a very cold hearted wizard of the entire stream of that content. Uh, the, the question was, do the terms and conditions of, of social platforms put, uh, are they the trump card for the social companies doing research because we have an agreement with them that they can do research on, on the data, but it's much more difficult for researchers downstream of that who don't have that agreement. And I think you're absolutely right. In legal terms, uh, there's nothing that could be done with Facebook because that, that it was right there in the terms and conditions. Some of the timing of it was a bit weird, um, but it's definitely, they have that thing that say, this is just... Uh, a legal issue and we're, we're able to do it. But researchers absolutely do not have those kinds of protections in terms of using uh, data that's, uh, that's been put out there. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks again, Dan. Uh, we'll break now until 3.15 for coffee for real this time and then we'll be back for the fun session at quarter past the hour.